And we've all been at live football games. We watched them on TVs, and we see how the players know sort of when to, they have to get into the, the midst of their huddle and call the signals and break huddle and get up to the line of scrimmage. And when that little clock starts ticking uh, and for the play clock in olden times, and what starts out with a certain signal by the referee, the ready for play signal, and it's history. Coming up today with footballarchaeology.com's Timothy P. Brown. And we're up with Tim in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history, and welcome to Tuesday. It's footballarchaeology.com day with Timothy P. Brown, bringing us another exciting aspect of football history. Tim, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Hey, Darren. Thank you. Looking forward to uh, signaling and talking about the ready to play signal. Well, actually, I'm... pretty pretty cool stuff. I think. Yeah, I'm definitely ready to play to, to hear this and uh, to hit play and have you uh, tell us all about the history of this signal that I'm very familiar with. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's one of those where, you know, I think a lot of us non-officials, um, you know, we tend to think of the official signals as the ones they give for penalties, and then obviously scoring opportunities and things like that. But there's other signals that happen on virtually every play of the game uh, that we just kind of don't even think about that very that it, much. This one happens every scrimmage down. But yeah. And every kicking down too. Yeah. yeah so. And so it's like it's, it happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I forget how I – I think, you know, I came across an article on this or um, – but – so, you know, this is really about the, you know, if when you go back to the history of football, you know, it came from rugby. And so, you know, back in the day, um, it was much more of a continuous action game. You know, the game did not stop. Um, well, originally we didn't have downs in football, so, you know, definitely didn't stop. But even after, after there were downs, you know, I, I've done a tidbit or a story at least on, you know, kind of breaking down the 1903 Yale Princeton game film. And which is really a fun, a fun thing mm -hmm. to watch and to, and to read if you're interested in, in the breakdown of it. But one of the things that's really clear from seeing that film is the pace of play. You know, the, somebody gets tackled, the center gets over the ball. Referee never touches the darn thing. Center gets over the ball. And as soon as, the quarterback calls the signals, boom, they run the play. So they're moving. You know, it's much more of like a rugby sort of pace. You don't have the stupid officials getting in the middle of everything and mucking things up for the players. All those, they need, the, the I'm, zebras I'm, I'm didn't plugging have, my ears as you're saying this. Yes, I'm not I know. Listening that's that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> um, the zebras didn't even have stripes in those days. But but it was just a very rapid pace of play. You know, they when they played a 45 minute half, they played 45 minutes. Um, so and even when the ball went out of bounds originally, you know, the players were the ones that brought the ball back in, either by tossing it in like a line out, they could toss it back, they could punt it onto the field, or they could walk it in after declaring how far they were going to walk it in. So um so anyways, it was just a, a different animal. But then then the 20s came about. And in the 20s, you had a couple things going on. You had uh, the no Notre Dame box or Notre Dame shift. The Minnesota shift was you know popular. So you had a bunch of teams doing all these shifts before they snapped the ball, which slowed down the pace of play a little bit, right? Because they'd get in formation, then they all jump and you know, moved right or left, whatever they were doing. And then the other thing that happened in the twenties is we had the beginning of consistent huddling. You know, there'd been a couple of people that huddled before that, but really, you know, Zupke and Illinois, they're the ones who really made huddling happen. And so that was, again, a thing that while 
while they typically got the playoff almost as fast as teams that didn't huddle, it still kind of slowed the game down a little bit. So, um, so then one of the tactics that came about was as the as things weren't quite as fast as they had been in the past, and as much as anything, teams were starting to use different formations instead of just always aligning in the in the traditional T. They were starting to use, um, you know, like a single wing that either was to the left or to the right. So you know they were they were taking time to move into different formations. And so one thing, and then the defense would take a little bit of time to react and, and align themselves to, to whatever the offense was doing. So one of the things the offense started doing was running quickie plays where they'd like get into a formation and boom, snap it faster than, you know, to kind of catch the defense off guard, which became problematic because then sometimes the defense was in, they were defensive, defenseless players in today's terminology. So it became a safety issue. Um, the other thing that was happening is that they would sometimes like send, you know, um, once uh, then a little bit later when uh, substitutions became, you know, started freeing up, you'd see teams sending three guys off the field and putting two guys on. So they were missing a player. Well, sometimes they'd have that missing player standing right on the sideline um kind of hiding himself <laughs> sometimes that was called lonesome pole cat or lonesome lonesome end but you know that was kind of a also kind of different but nevertheless the concept was that there'd be a guy over there all by himself and they'd snap the ball and he'd head downfield so they toss him the pee and you know hopefully you know catch a long touchdown pass so all that stuff led in 1951 to a rule that said the referee has to spot the ball on every play. And because again, previously it was much more of the center doing that. So with the referee spotting the ball on every play, he had, they developed what they called the ready to play signal to indicate to the players that the ball was ready to be snapped. Right. And until he gave that signal, it couldn't be snapped. And so what I didn't realize until I got into you know doing this research was what that signal meant, right? Because there's a lot of signals that are just kind of meaningless. They're just some kind of arm motion, but they don't really relate to the penalty themselves. Mm -hmm. There's other things like the holding penalty, right? You one arm, you know, yeah, you know, they grab the wrist or just below the wrist. So okay, that means holding. That makes sense. And at least the old clipping rule, you know, made sense. There's others like that, you know, block in the back, maybe Locked face mask. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, but the, so the ready to play signal, um, that orig the signal, which is some of the drawings make it look like he's kind of going with a full arm motion, but I think of them mostly as like kind of pulling straight down. You know, they raise their arm and then pull straight down. Maybe you can tell me that. What is uh, the proper? It's the the first one that you said because they they call it uh, the term on the field is they call it chopping the ball in for play. So you're, it's almost like you have a little hatchet and you're you okay. Know, you're just you're chop, so making a extended, chopping motion. Extended arm, right? But the the whistle is really the the true signal. The the referee blowing yeah. that whistle every play uh, and chopping the ball in, saying it's ready for play. And it's and, and I know. Uh, because of recent uh, timing rules in between plays, it used to be when the 25 second clock would start. Now, you know, a lot of levels have changed that. So you have 40 seconds or something in between when the ball was last dead to get the next snap off. But that's when that would used to start too at the ready for play. So it's an important, okay. important part. And it also starts the clock if you had. Uh, a play where like, you got a first down, you had an official's timeout. So you stopped the clock in high school to reset the chains. The ready for play would start the clock again in motion. Okay. Well, so part of what I liked about the story was just that that, that chopping signal was supposed to be, at least some of the period articles said that that was supposed to be akin to uh you know, the conductor on a train pulling the chain, the 
blew the steam whistle or hmm. you know factory factories used to have whistles that you know to mark the end of a shift or you know lunchtime whatever it may be um so it was pulling the chain and um yeah and then even like you know i know when it, when my kids were younger it sometimes they'd make that signal to truck drivers to get them to honk right. their horns as we're driving by because horns on trucks you know the especially the horns that they have on the roof you know used to be you know pull a chain to make them um you know yeah, I, to make I, the think, sound. I, I think you're technically right if you look at the official signals like when they have them on cards or in the back of books and everything it is more of like the like you're saying like this but i i don't know there's very few that do that and it's probably because we're you know we're doing that a hundred times in a game uh you're you know blood rushes out of your hand you're, yeah. you're just having it down more towards your well, chest and your waist to, do so it, to chop it in the, the original images all show a full chop an extended okay. arm chop right? okay it, almost like the florida state people right okay that kind of a uh that kind of emotion so but i didn't know if that had evolved over time or not but th that was for sure the the er early signal oh, okay or yeah, and I, I know that's the way I always did. And that's why and I did it by observing my peers when I was before I was a referee, when I was a line judge and uh, yeah. head linesman, I would watch it and the referee would do that. So but they always called it chopping the ball and, you know, it's OK. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but part again, part of part of the, the amusement for me is just um, and I kind of ended the, this particular tidbit bit by saying, OK, so. I went through, I think there's 45 or 47 current NCAA signals for the officials and just kind of saying, okay, well, about half of them seem to have an inherent meaning. They kind of match whatever the the signal is, right? Or that what whatever the infraction is or whatever they're signaling. Whereas whereas others, it's like, you know, putting your arms out and yeah, but that, <laughs> you know, there's like Okay, I don't know what that means, but you know, I mean, it's just like any kind of semaphore flags. You know, you're crossing them or waving them. You know, like the guys on aircraft carriers. You know, it's like okay, well, whatever. It, as long as it means something to somebody, then it'll I, I, work. I, there's, you're right. I mean, and it when you're learning the, the signals as an official, when you're a referee, I mean, there, there, that was it's that was like the thing that freaked me out when they said, okay, this is your first game and you're a referee. I, that was the thing I panicked. Like, I know the rules. I know what the yeah. signals are, but I'm thinking, God, you have that stage fright. You know, everybody's looking at you to, to signal. And the ones I had problems with is you have the, the illegal substitution and you have the signal. I would get those two mixed up constantly. And I, I would have to study almost, you know, my first, especially that first season. I'm looking at the, that card every single uh, game. And before I go out there, I'm like, oh God, I don't want to get, you know, screw this thing up and have the wrong signal. And the yeah. PA announcer announces the opposite thing of what I was calling. So it's, yeah, so it's, uh, it's inter interesting. And I, I love how, you know, the signals match, you know, like face mask, like you said, or horse collar, which is a yeah. sort of a newer signal that that's, there's no doubt what, what the guy did when you, when you're signaling that holding, yeah. you know, you, you sit there and you think about it very rarely in football. Have I ever called holding because some, uh, uh some an opponent grabbed the other opponent's wrist to do it, but, right, but right. you get the gist. Of but what still, it it, it right. still make it makes sense. But uh, and, and it's kind of cool that hockey and lacrosse and sports like that have adopted football's officials uh, signals for holding and and some of those things. They use the same signals on some of those. That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Those baseball guys there, yeah, they're kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Tim, that, it's, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, I love when, uh, you know, we get into something that happens every day that people maybe just don't really realize it's happening yeah. and you bring out that aspect of football and then you take the history of it and how it evolved. That's just such a, a cool aspect of, of what you do. And maybe you could share with folks how they can enjoy some of your other work that you've done on some items like this. Sure. Uh, just basically go to footballarchaeology.com um, and just subscribe. It's a pretty effortless process, and you'll you'll get an email every time that that uh, 
I post a new new article. And then there's, you know, different ways to follow me on social media as well. And then, you know, I'll also just put in a plug. I've got a, a new book coming out called A History of the Football that basically just goes back to literally the Middle Ages and kind of traces how the football has changed, shape, size, color, stripes, weight, inflation levels, just kind of all kinds of little dorky little things about the football. But some of it, you know, there's, I think, you know, came across some, found some pretty interesting stuff, interesting stories about how things changed and how, you know, in some cases, some personalities and individuals like George Hallis, you know, had an influence on the ball that we know and love today. Well, great. Sounds like some great stuff. And uh, we'd love to hear more about it and uh, love to talk to you about some more football history next Tuesday. Very good. Look forward to it. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.